Hi, Pietro. How are you? Hey, great, Drew. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're back here live on track four, uh, following the great practitioner debate. We're here with uh, Pietro, who is the president and founder at Transitional Forms. And we're looking forward to hearing uh, a little bit about how AI is impacting the world of creativity. Uh, so Pietro, I'll just uh, give a little bit of house rules here. Um, we've got 20 minutes for the presentation, followed by five minutes of Q&A. Um, I'll give you a little time check uh, a couple of minutes before the Q&A. And when it is time for the questions, I'll come back on and help just read out some questions from the audience here uh, and have a little discussion. So if that sounds good, I can let you have it. That sounds great. Thank you, Drew. All right, all yours, Pietro. Awesome. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me today. It's a real honor to be here amongst the, the amazing presenters uh, uh, today. And um, my name is Pietro. I'm the CCO and uh, founder of a company called Transitional Forms. We're an entertainment innovation company in Toronto. And it is my goal today to show you as many examples of agents in production uh, output by one small team um, of the whole day. So we'll see if I hit that goal. Um, but in this presentation, I'm hoping to give you uh, a bit of an introduction on um, who I am, my backstory, and and what led me to become um, to, to found Transitional Forms. And uh, I'd like to take you through, as I said, a bunch of uh, uh, examples of agents and production, some behind the scenes, and a number of projects that we've done um, in our company. And uh, yeah, some um, some time at the end. I'm hoping we can go through the ultimate example of a multi-agent in production system. So I'll give you a sneak peek on that. Um, hopefully we have time and uh, some time for Q&A. So please um, throw your questions in the chat. Uh, I don't have any feedback other than the the emojis. So uh, hammer those emojis too, so I can so I know you're listening. And uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so, uh, as most stories start once upon a time, um, I was a, at a company called, uh, 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 Secret Location was a company that I co-founded many years ago and I was, uh, we, we sold it to Entertainment One. And so this is a, a picture of me outside of my office at, at E1. Um, things were good, uh, you know, lots of uh, awards and a great team and benefits and vacation and all of that stuff. But um, there was one problem in that my... I'd say my entire life, I was fascinated by robots and growing up reading science fiction. You know, we we, we hear a lot about the coming uh, technological singularity. And uh, I was uh, I was concerned that creative machine intelligence was coming and, uh, you know, started ringing that bell about seven years ago. And but there was a problem where I would Google it and I didn't even know what to Google. <laughs> this isn't a real screenshot. This is uh, this is what it felt like, though, um, where where, you know, you'd, you'd search like robots making art or creative machine intelligence or um, creative AI. Like, what do you even search? Uh, there was stuff in the research world, but there was really nothing in the zeitgeist that uh, spoke about um, creativity and AI. Of course, AI could drive a car. Of course, AI could work in a factory. A robot could, you know, work in a factory. But could they make art? Never. And so that was a, that was an interesting moment. And so despite all odds, I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, I quit my job, started a new company called called Transitional Forms, and we started a uh, as a studio lab focused on what we called at the time creative machine intelligence. Now it's called Gen AI, but there was no term for it back then. And uh, yeah, focused on creative machine intelligence. And as the name would suggest, Transitional Forms was also interested in the evolution of AI and culture. Uh, more specifically, given my background at Secret Location and nonlinear interactive media um, and uh, and the stuff that we were doing at E1, um, we wanted to focus transitional forms on the evolution of entertainment itself in that there were new forms of media that were coming uh, as a result of, of this new creative machine intelligence. So as I said, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this presentation on AI agents in production. I love the theme uh, because at, uh, at 
uh, transforms. We've been doing agents in production for many years, and we have so many examples. Um, being in entertainment, you know, the way that we look at it is this is AI agents being autonomous systems, um, any sort of uh, artificial intelligence. It doesn't have to be large language models, um, although we, we have examples of that. Um, but uh, autonomous systems as it relates to entertainment production. So the examples I'll be taking you through today are uh, reinforcement learning and heuristic AI in uh, film production, music transformers in real-time music production, um, reinforcement learning in video game production, and large language models in television production. And as I said before, we're we're working on uh, releasing a product soon that is a multi-agent, uh, multimodal. You know, this is the real uh, golden goose of what I think is the ultimate example of agents in production um, and all from the smartphone in your pocket. So we'll get to that at the end. Uh, so let's begin, talk a little behind the scenes uh, and I'll, uh, I'll start with our first project ever at Transforms, which was called Agents. And this is an example of reinforcement learning and uh, behavioral heuristic AI in, uh, in a film. So a quick shout out before we go into this project to the uh, the funding institutions that have supported us, the Canada Media Fund, Ontario Creates, they uh, often support our work and we're very grateful for them. Um, and another fine Canadian institution, the National Film Board of Canada um, was the first uh, institution that I um, uh, engaged uh, starting transitional forms, I pitched them a crazy idea that I wasn't sure was even possible. It was probably barely on the cusp of being possible. And they said, yep, let's do it. And I pulled up a chair and we started work right away. So shout out to these uh, fine Canadian institutions for support. Um, so Agents was was started as an idea on whether, whether or not we could create uh, artificially intelligent characters that lived inside of a virtual film and give them the ability to make their own decisions, give them agency within the film world and allow their decisions to uh, basically dictate what happens in the film. So it would be different every single time. Um, the audience would have a bit of agency. The characters would have agency. How might we do this? Um, so we were really trying to pioneer a new medium. At the time, we called it a dynamic film because we weren't sure, you know, Gen AI wasn't a term. So we wanted to, um, you know, uh, uh, think of a new a new term for it. Um, so yeah, we pursued this dynamic film um, with rigor. And here's some pictures of the behind the scenes uh, uh, at our studio. We built this uh, world to train uh, agents. We were using reinforcement learning because um, that was hot at the time. Um, we uh, we built this world where gravity goes straight down. That's part of the, the concept of the film where they all have to cooperate to survive on the top of this planet. And so you're seeing uh, early prototypes on figuring out how do we get them to cooperate or not cooperate? Um, how do we train them to live on this planet? Uh, how do we, what do they see? What do they understand about this world? So we went through a lot of iteration and it was very exciting. And uh, here's a trailer of the final product. Hopefully the sound works, so. There's a little gag here at the end. Yeah, just wait for it. Boom, killing agents to make the film. Millions of agents died to make this film. And, uh, but it's true, uh, you know, we were doing reinforcement learning. So it, it, it required uh, agents to live on this planet and die a million times over to figure it out. 
Um, more on reinforcement learning and how that can be used in production in a, in a minute. But uh, the results of Agents were very exciting. Um, we premiered at the Venice Film Festival, uh, d lots of uh, film festivals and awards. Um, the NFB was really uh, supportive in that. Um, critically acclaimed MIT, uh, the MIT Tech Review called it a future of what AI filmmaking could be. So that was a real honor. Um, and this was like four or five years ago now. Um, and, uh, yeah, successfully proved the concept and, uh, and created a new medium, although it was hard to launch a, uh, a new medium like this, cause everyone thought it was a game, but maybe we can talk more about that in uh, Q and a later. Um, oh, and some great research came out of it too. We collaborated with Google brain and Google DeepMind on putting out a paper. Um, uh, yeah, check it out if you're into, into that stuff. So another project that I wanted to take you through is called Project Malachi. Uh, this was uh, more of an experiment around real-time music. And if we could use real-time uh, music transformers, specifically Magenta by Google, and see if we could uh, create music on the shape of a curve. And now I know that um, uh, this was a huge inspiration. I don't know if anyone in the chat here knows the uh, uh, the Kurt Vonnegut video. It's very old. It's on YouTube on uh, the shape of story. Um, but we were really inspired by this idea that stories could have a shape where you have uh, positive valence and negative valence. And, you know, over the course of a story, you could have that kind of uh, roller coaster or trajectory on um, the shape of the story. And so what we did was we created an interface um, that allowed you to uh, transform music based on curves. So uh, we started with the valence curve, you know, high being um, positive valence, uh, positive emotion, low being negative valence. And then we added other uh, curves for energy and complexity and depth. And it was really good. Uh, it, it produced music. Um, it was near real time, which is what we needed. And uh, and knowing that, you know, in the future, we're going to have these holodeck like experiences. And how are you going to score something that's unfolding in real time? Um, so that's why we built this thing. Although um, it is a concept that we shelved for now and we'll uh, we'll likely uh, visit it later, but happy to answer any questions if you have any on this. Oh, and um, uh, sorry, um, research came out of this too. We, we had uh, collaborated with Google Brain again and some folks at Google Magenta. Um, let's see. So uh, the next project I wanted to take you through is called Little Learning Machines. And this is an example of reinforcement learning in a video game. And it is uh, based on the idea that uh, came out of agents where we were training, um, you know, agents to live inside of our film and the process was very, very complex. So, you know, we had, we had our, our engineers working on it. We had uh, um, advice from, from people at Google. Um, and it was, it was so so hard just to even set up the training environment. And so we thought, hey, you know, this is such a powerful technology. Um, it's, it's very simple. It's based on positive and negative rewards. What if we could build a game that allowed people to train neural networks right within the game itself? So uh, that was our goal in this. And we thought this would be very important for the world right now. It would foster a better understanding of machine intelligence. People might be able to empathize with how machines learn, especially in a world where we're surrounded by neural networks. So we pursued uh, building this game. Here's some behind the scenes uh, screenshots of, of our progress. Very early prototype in the top left corner. Um, and then the top right uh, was the next version and bottom left and bottom right were the following versions. Um, it, was, uh, it was exciting to see that we could A, install a game and get reinforcement learning going and B, uh, connect with these creatures based on, um, based on rewards. Oh, and a note on that, the rewards that we, you know, anybody listening who knows about reinforcement learning knows it's all about positive and negative rewards. So it's like training a puppy, you know, punishment, don't punish your puppy, but punishment for things that you don't want them to do, positive rewards for things that you do want to do. Um, and for the agents that live in this, this world, uh, we use the analogy of love and fear. So in the game, uh, users can use love or fear and say, I love petting the dog, or I love uh, cutting down trees, or I hate uh, falling off the edge. I, I hate, uh, you know, getting hit by fire or something like that. So um, that's what we base the game on. And uh, here's a little um, 
a little trailer for you. Welcome to Little Learning Machines, a real-time simulation game where you and AI robots solve whimsical challenges together. In this enchanting world, your choices shape what's possible. Train your AI robots to master new skills. Watch their personalities come to life as you travel across diverse island worlds. Ready to team up with your own real AI robots? Little Learning Machines, available now. So as the um, excitable uh, voiceover said, it is available now on Steam. So uh, go check it out if you'd like. And the uh, the results were um, pretty fantastic on this one. We did achieve what we wanted to. Uh, anyone, like literally anyone who can play a video game can now train agents, can now train a neural network right within the game itself. At the time, I think my son was six years old, six or seven, and he trained his first neural network. So I'm pretty proud of that accomplishment through this game. And uh, yeah, it's a it's an example of how we're lowering the bar uh, to access these um, incredible world-changing technologies. And we actually got people to care about these little, uh, little agents that lived in the world. Oh, uh, and research came out of it too. We can't forget um, the research paper uh, that came out of it and uh, very proud of that one. So the next project I wanted to take you through is called Robots Make TV. And this is, you know, everybody's hot on language models and that's great, but this is an example of uh, language models in television production. So at the time that we started this project, it was uh, GPT-2 was uh, the technology that we had access to and it had to run locally and it was very clunky and it was hilariously hallucinatory, um, but we, uh, we loved it. And so what we did was we tied it to a Unity game engine and created some rules for the world and thought, hey, you know, this could infinitely generate um, content for us uh, uh, based on GPT-2. So we, uh, we iterated and iterated this and uh, kept on the, the mission on how to prove generative and interactive potential of, uh, of real-time language models. Um, now, the real-time aspect was probably the hardest part, uh, but this is an early uh, prototype that we built called Director's Chair, where users can go in and um, generate potential next lines of the dialogue, uh, seed uh, initial um, uh, parts of the dialogue, and let the, the language model take over from there. We built it all modular so that you could swap environments and swap characters and um, even had real-time effects like throwing food or setting fires or uh, changing gravity. Um, so this was a really exciting project, and uh, it started coming together right away. From our prototype, we started adding more environments and more characters, more backstories, uh, um, you know, show templates and stuff like that. We ended up uh, streaming for 14 days straight. I, I believe that was our, our record of just streaming endless new content. So um, we were very early days in, in this new medium and, and, and super proud of it. Here is an example of one of the uh, pieces of content that that, uh, that project put out. And I will warn you, I think there's some swearing in this, but here we go. Babe, these potatoes are fucking delicious. Yes, they are. It's been a while since I had some homemade mashed potatoes. How it would make life better. What? This weird love potion I found. <laughs> you can, you can, the audience It'll could make us food, all madly so in love all over again see, and get uh, us out of this rut we're in. Love potion, that sounds like a terrible <clears throat> idea. Oh, that would make things even worse. I'd rather have it be the same kind of relationship we had before than be in a creepy relationship based on a love spell. I don't want to be a puppet in someone else's love story. You're right. We don't need a love potion. We just need to talk to each other. Just noticed I've got uh, only a couple minutes left. So I'm going to get to showing you guys um, a... I won't play the video, but we've, we've built a new product called uh, Simia that is based on this, uh, based on the world changing, the, cre the world of creati creativity changing, human creativity is changing um, from... Uh, 
the, the power of generative AI. And so we decided we're going to supercharge content creators now with our first product. Um, it's called, let me just skip ahead here. It's called Simia and you can generate and remix endless amounts of content and share them with your friends. A uh, lot of fart jokes if you want, um, but it's a, it's a really fun system. I won't play the, the uh, teaser video, but um, I will end. Please reach out to me so I can. Hey there, the thanks for checking Oops. out this pitch. There's the teaser. Um, please reach out to me uh, so I can um, share the teaser. But here is a QR code to please sign up for the early access um, to Simia. Um, it's a really exciting new platform where you can uh, generate. Uh, it's a multimodal, multi multi agent framework that you can generate uh, content from the power of your smartphone in your pocket. So um, happy to go back through if there's any questions on on any of the stuff that we talked about. But uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thanks so much, Pietro. Uh, what a what a great presentation and uh, super fun to see all the different sort of characters and and early experiments going on and how it's changed as the technology is changing. Really, really cool to share. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so I uh, have a couple of questions here from the audience and um, just wanted to to bring those up right now. So. You know, one thing that uh, <clears throat> that we're seeing here is um, this contrast that's starting to that a lot more people are talking about these days uh, between sort of you know fast AI versus slow AI. Mm. And this difference in the persistence of these systems, right? So um, you know, right now, ChatGPT is kind of like the the definition of a, or any assistant is really like the definition of a quick. You know, it's just like ping pong, pop pop back and forth. Um, and then the, the on the other side is you know folks who are putting uh, agents into learning Minecraft and letting it run for you know three months and seeing how things go. Um, I thought your your early experiments there <clears throat> with the building the worlds and and having the all the characters running around really kind of interesting in that more persistent way. I'm just curious, like you know if you're seeing that or, or how you think about it from a narrative perspective, because uh, it's a really different way of thinking about AI. Sure. Yeah. So one one of the things that we were excited to do in, in terms of multi agent systems was to give characters their own backstory, which in in Simia and in Robots Make TV characters have their own backstory and they they act accordingly. And we thought, okay, what if each agent was their own? What if each character wasn't their own agent? And so we built um, uh, we started experimenting with these characters going into the world and acting on behalf of their backstory, and it worked it was very interesting and certainly that is a vision of the future of these like long form narratives but what happened was and it was very interesting the storytelling started to really drop mm -hmm. so the agents wouldn't do anything that was out of character or wouldn't do anything that showed that they were flawed or that they were frustrated or that they were confused and so you got these flat lined stories where everyone is just cooperating according to who they who they are and so what we're finding now is in in our new multi-agent system is uh having uh a director agent that is controlling the story and saying conflict here now you know introduce this um you know tension between characters and that helps for storytelling um whereas we thought that the the multi-agent system with uh with characters being who they are that that would be uh, good enough for story yeah, no, it's I you almost giggle because it's like, oh, these robots are acting like robots. What's wrong with them? You know? Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, like, yeah the exactly. humanity, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe if that's a little uh, insight to how we, how it'll be with androids walking around, they'll they'll just stick to what they're doing. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, I think another another theme that we're seeing here is really around. Um, <clears throat> You know, a lot of talks today have been more on the the sort of business side, startups looking for uh, solutions, maybe to healthcare issues or um, you know, a, a data analytics solutions and things like this. One of the reasons that we're hosting this um, this conference this year from the museum uh, is really to bring in the world of art and the world of narrative and make sure that as this new technology is growing. Um, you know, there's a creative angle. There's a there's a non sort of a, a business angle there because there's so much to learn um, when we're in in sort of a um, 
you know, maybe a more technical setting or a business setting, uh, thinking about, you know, empathizing with, you know, consumers or, or thinking about just how people really live their lives and what's important to them. Mm -hmm. um, curious, you know, kind of, again, as you're developing these characters, <clears throat> do you struggle with making them human? You were talking about having a director there. Um, are there other things that you've noticed in terms of, of bringing out that humanity or is it uh, is just a different sort of world? Well, one of our, um, you know, it's in our DNA at, at Transitional Forms to empathize with the, the machine, to create properties and pieces of content that allow humans to understand what it means to be machine and, and machines what it means to be human. So, um, yeah, like I think that it's, the, the artfulness and the the real-time capabilities of it really help you to um, engage with the content because it's it's literally engaging. You could, like, even in the days of agents, um, the researchers from, from Google that we were working with, they were like, wow, you know, I look at charts and graphs all day to see if these agents are being optimized for learning. And, you know, in this film, I can actually see them um, see them take action. I can, I can be inside of the world with them, you know, especially in VR. Um, so yeah, I think that, that, that the artistic side, the, 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 the creativity, if you were, is, is a really powerful angle for, um, for not just human empathy, but machine empathy as well. I think that's a really important thing that, that we're, uh, we're, we're facing now. Cool. Cool, great. Well, Pedro, we're out of time now, uh, but thank you so much, uh, and good luck with with the game and uh, with all of your future projects. Thank you. Great, thank you so much.